did you find yourself in the Hague? Kind of give me a little chronology as to how you got yourself there. Uh, in the in the Hague with the Taylor case, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I at one point I uh, I joined the special court for Sierra Leone, so I went over to to Freetown uh, first as a deputy registrar and then a bit later as registrar. Uh, and as a registrar, you're basically responsible for the entire administrative and judicial support stuff. So you you assist the judges, but the prosecutor, the defence counsel as well. So what time was this time period? I'm talking about 2006 when I joined to 2000 when I went back to The Hague for another job uh, and so when I joined the special court just two or three months before that Charles Taylor got arrested um, and was brought over to The Hague because the trial was not for security reasons wasn't able to be held in in Freetown which of course is a pity but it was really security reasons dictated that so brought over to The Hague um, and as registrar you're responsible for the entire support so what you also are responsible for is the detention for any accused persons. You know as a registrar you're neutral because you, you serve all parties and you support the judges. So it wasn't, for me it wasn't an issue to talk to all the detained people in, in Freetown but also to Charles Taylor in, in The Hague um, and I was responsible for making sure that the detention was up to the international standards by which those tribunals work uh, and I always call that tea with Taylor you know so what happened was uh, court proceedings were always going on from Monday to Thursday and a bit on Friday morning and Friday afternoon there were no hearings so whenever I was in The Hague, I spent most of my time in Freetown but part of it in The Hague, whenever I was in The Hague I thought you know what I'll go, go over and see how the detention issues are, hear whether there are any issues with him. Um, and of course, he, he always had issues to raise, um, but of course, there are also very strict rules. But I just wanted to make sure, uh, because that is what's my responsibility, I want to make sure that the guy was in good shape, and if there was anything, that I was aware of it. Uh, of course, I heard it from the staff who were supervising him 24 and 7. But I also wanted to do that just with my own eyes and ears. Um, and we had very cordial discussions. He always made some tea for me, and you know, we had some discussions in his tiny little cell. Um, discuss all kind of things, yeah, but of course also detention issues, complaining about the food, and of course Dutch food he didn't like, which I understand being Dutch. But you know, it's it was an, a strange experience but I thought it was really necessary to make sure that for him as any other detained person he's entitled to the principles that apply to uh, you know people who are considered innocent uh, until proven guilty and um, that was during the entire trial um, so I yeah I met with him on a number of occasions and um, you know chit chats and detention issues and all that and um, we never had any major issues with him while he was detained over there. What was your impressions of the guy? He's you know quite a rock and tour. He's uh, had a variety of careers if you will before becoming president. Yeah. How did you get a sense of him as a person? Yeah that is that's that's an interesting question uh, because he's of course let, let's be clear he's an incredibly smart guy. Um, also very charming. Uh, you know he's of course, that's how people like that get in those kind of positions. Uh, yeah, of course, he's been convicted for very serious crimes, and uh, that were committed in in Sierra Leone. Uh, and uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, charisma goes with those characters often. Uh, otherwise, they don't get elected as presidents or as major leaders in a particular country. Um, so it it is amazing to see. Um, that there's a human being next to the accusations and the conviction later on uh, and it's it's sometimes difficult to to bring them together uh, but yeah very charismatic uh, incredibly smart and all these kind of things but hey he was a detainee and um, the rules applied to him equally as to other any other detainees over there uh, but it was it was an interesting it was an interesting discussions yes definitely well, I uh, harken back to the Nuremberg trial and yeah. Herman Goering, yeah. who was incredibly charismatic, and he really worked the guards. Yeah. He really was 
wonderfully engaged with him. So they actually did some more favors probably for him than anybody else. Yeah. Did you find that? Have you? Did you find that the case where Taylor was trying to work the system? He may have tried it, but it didn't work because you know we had one cell for him, um, and we rented the facilities from the International Criminal Court, um, and so there were other detainees in this uh, in the same complex. Uh, from other parts of, of the world of accused persons who were tried by the International Criminal Court. And in detention, the, always you ha have to do is don't make any distinction between any of the accused persons. The moment you give a favor to one, you have to give it to everyone else. There, you cannot make a distinction. And also, in that respect also, no, he didn't get anything else that he may have wanted, but he didn't stand out towards the others, the others didn't stand out towards him. Very same rules, very same conditions. He may have liked them, he may not have liked them, uh, but that's the reality that that he was facing as, as a detained person and as an accused person uh, in trial over there. Uh, he may have had his questions, of course, um, always trying to push it a bit, but you know, the rules are there for everyone. So you became a registrar a few months before he actually was arrested. A few months after he was arrested. Yeah, 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 yeah. So your paths would have crossed with Desmond. No, I just came one month after Desmond actually left. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one month. It was really, we just did not overlap. Gotcha. Yeah. So Stephen Rapp would have been... Yeah, it know. was even before, because it was, it took about half a year after Desmond left when Stephen Rapp joined, and I was just in that period. Um, so Desmond left I think in around April, May or something like that. I came there early July and Stephen Rapp came towards the end of that year in 2006. Yeah, yeah. Were you here when we had all of them, all four of them, uh, at the interlaw dialogues and we did an inter I did an interview with the four of them on the Taylor case? No, I was, I, I've been here last year for the dialogues and now this year, but I haven't been at the previous ones. Yeah, 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 because they are, of course, you know, I know David Crane very well. I didn't have much interaction with Desmond and De Silva, but of course Stephen Rapp I work with very well, with Brenda Holly. So you, you know the people that actually have given shape to the cases at that court, you know, and it has been a great pleasure to work with all of them. Um, strong characters, believers in the system, uh, and it was absolutely great to, to do that and to work with them and to see that, you know, all those trials were delivered in a reasonable period of time. I must say that in that respect, probably the special court for Salio did not get enough credit for how effectively it was the proceedings went, the trials were organized, uh, and how the entire work was done. The outreach project uh, that the court had as of day one until the very last day, uh, that really made that court a big success. And if I compare all the different ad hocs and, and also the International Criminal Court where I served as a registrar for five years, then I can see of the ad hocs, I think the Special Court for Sierra Leone really did a fantastic job. And outreach was one of the major things that really stood out as making the difference. Um, you know, being able to actually tell practically everyone in Sierra Leone what the court was, what it was about, what it was to do. Uh, of course, hey, it was only about up to about 10 people who were, you know, tried. Uh, of course, there were many more perpetrators, but you can't do all cases. You have to make a selection. But within the limits that apply to all of those institutions, I think the special court did a fantastic job. Um, and uh, I think there is more and more recognition for um, the strategy as to which people to target and to focus on in the trial, uh, the way it was managed, the outreach project, the cooperation with the government there, um, big support from their side, and also the population by and large was very supportive. You know what, that's, that's a success story. That's amazing. Not in the near future. Unfortunately not. You know what, of, of, well, as you mentioned, you know, apart from the permanent court, well, the permanent court is supposed to actually, the mandate is quite clear that the permanent court is there for all instances of major violations. Uh, and, you know, if we talk about Myanmar, if we talk about Syria, 
uh, if we talk about so many other situations in this world. That's what the court has been created for. But the court can't touch it because Myanmar, Syria are not states parties. So then Security Council can refer cases to the ICC, but the political dynamics in the Security Council, the major powers at the moment, unfortunately are not interested in international justice. You know, Russia, no. China, no. But unfortunately also these days the US, no. They're not interested in that. That's a huge shortcoming. Um, and you know the victims of crimes in Syria, the victims of crimes in Myanmar, I know, and, and in so many other situations, their desire for justice is not going to disappear. Um, and the international community has a responsibility, whether through state parties, security council, whatever it is. So you have those mechanisms now, like in for Syria, uh, for Myanmar, they collect the evidence. Hopefully some national jurisdictions can pick up on the cases, but they probably can't really go to the leadership uh, and to get to the core of those people who really have the major responsibility for the crimes. And that is, that is a shortcoming and um, unfortunately it reflects also badly on the ICC beyond their control, but it also reflects because everyone is saying, hey ICC, why don't you deal with those cases? But they can't. Unfortunately, you know, back in the 1990s, I was I was involved in negotiations leading up to the adoption of the ICC statute. The American delegation played a big role over there. Uh, David Chever was the head of the delegation over there. We're still good friends up to today, uh, and you know, he believed in the creation of the ICC. It wasn't possible at that time to join, um, but you know. At that time, the U.S. was a strong supporter of international justice. The effectiveness also of the Yugoslav Tribunal is also based on the cooperation and support that the U.S. gave to the, the tribunals over there. The intelligence that was shared with the ISTY, with the prosecutor, had a huge impact on the effectiveness of those trials and the convictions of people. And the ICC is lacking that. And so um, under Obama, we can, uh, when I was still working at the ICC, I could see there was cooperation. And, and as I've said before, you know, sometimes some non-states parties were more supportive of the court than states parties. And with non-state party at that time, I meant the US as well. Unfortunately, that's not the situation now. And, you know, keep fingers crossed that that will change. So you're part of the show here. I am part of the show, yeah. What, what, just give us a sneak preview. I think I'm going to talk a bit about what you're asking me now. It's, it's about sort of, you know, okay, what happened, why, did the, why was the ICC created in the late 90s? What were the preconditions that made it happen at that time? Um, you know, basically the, the bottom line is, if there was no ICC today, uh, we wanted to discuss the creation of an international criminal court statute, the political situation at the moment would not allow for that to happen. The preconditions of an element of trust between major powers, etc., is not there. So today we would not have an ICC. So we do have an ICC. It has its own internal shortcomings, that's for sure, but also it has to work in an incredibly difficult political environment. Um, and I think it needs the help of anyone who is able to help to survive under those circumstances and to be as effective as it can. But it's a tough mandate. So Fatou's term is coming up soon. Yeah. Uh, what's the procedure to re, uh, for, for a replacement? They have, I don't know the exact details, but what they have decided is there's a, a group of ambassadors and a group of external experts who are going to do a sort of a, you know, a scooping, a sort of assessment of potential candidates that may become a prosecutor. Uh, what I think is incredibly important here is that the election of the prosecutor it shouldn't be a horse trading diplomatic event, but should be an election of the best candidate for their job. Because 
terribly difficult job. Um, the pressure is enormous, the challenges are there, and you really need to have someone who can stand up to the political pressure, and can get the investigations and the prosecutions organized well. Um, and, you know, so far the ICC has not shown the best track record compared to other international courts. Um, the new prosecutor, uh, hopefully, will be able under those difficult circumstances but will be able to deliver the best because in the end it's the quality of the investigations that determine the future of the outcome of those cases there and that is hasn't always been optimal at the, at the ICC to put it in diplomatic terms. You're terrific. Thank you. This is fun. Thank you for coming. Yeah, yeah no problem at all Greg. Yeah, great.